Thank you. Okay, uh, my name is Ben Worthy. I'm from uh, Birkbeck College, University of London, and with me is my colleague, Lazo Horvath. My expertise is in transparency and freedom of information, and Laszlo works on public opinion and technology. We were asked to write uh, a chapter about uh, AI lobbying and data, so this is the first time ever that we've exposed what we're thinking um, to public view, so we'd welcome any of your comments and thoughts. What I want to do is talk a little bit about lobbying, how we think about lobbying and what modern lobbying looks like before turning to the question you see before you. So just a reminder, the phrase lobbying comes from the late 19th century after a complaint by the American president, U.S. Grant, who loudly complained about the fact that there was always too many people waiting in the lobby of the White House ready to ask him for some favor or other. But I think when you think about lobbying, probably the first thing that comes into your mind is money, but it isn't necessarily about money. Lobbying is actually best thought of as attempts to influence people, either to do or not do something. Another way of conceptualizing lobbying is about access to people and also about information. Policymakers are, of course, desperate at the last minute to get information about all sorts of different things and lobbyists will provide them with it. And lobbying takes place at all sorts of different phases of the policy process. We traditionally think about lobbying happening in legislatures, around laws, but actually it's also about agenda control and agenda setting. And the final thing I do want to remind you of, which is often overlooked, is that lobbying is not necessarily a bad thing. It is actually a really important part of democracy. And I'll give you three examples. The abolition of the slave trade was as a result of the first ever modern lobbying campaign. The issue of climate change being so high on the agenda is partly, of course, because of what climate change is doing, but also because of intense lobbying efforts. And just to give you a very modern and contemporary example, the arrival of seatbelts in cars resulted from a huge lobbying campaign in the 1960s in the United States. So, without further ado, one of the ways to think about lobbying when we look at it through this lens is that lobbying is about the relationship between a number of different groups. You have the government who decide to what extent they want to regulate or create processes around lobbying. Then you have lobbyists who require access. Now, just to be fair to lobbyists, lobbyists are not against rules and processes. In fact, a lot of the time, they like clear rules and processes around lobbying because it makes their job easier. And then the third group you have are those who want to watch and monitor what's happening in the lobbying world. And that's often a mixture of the media, investigative journalists, and NGOs and civil society. So modern lobbying is much more about two things. The first thing that modern lobbying is about is data. Governments publish far more data about what's happening in the lobbying world. Here's some examples from the UK. Um, data about meetings between ministers and other parties. Extensive registers of interests where you can find the connections between different politicians uh, and different groups who might be giving them money or assistance in some way. It comes with a very large qualification. Lots of this data is incomplete, and there are many loopholes and ways around it. Nevertheless, it is becoming a more data-driven activity. The second area where actually it's happening in a new way is so-called grassroots lobbying. When you think about lobbying, you traditionally think about lobbyists and groups approaching politicians. But actually, there's a new strand or a newer strand to lobbying, whereby actually what lobbying organizations want to do is pressure the public who then in turn will pressure politicians. So there's a, this new kind of lobbying called grassroots lobbying. And I also want to, and this has been covered by uh, the other speakers much better than I, remind you that even though the data side of open data transparency and AI overlap to some extent, they are not the same thing. And these tools will not necessarily do the same thing. Of course, um, the kind of data-driven open aspect leads towards greater evidence, greater picture building, whereas AI, as I'll get on to in a minute, may be more about the mobilizing and campaigning side for different groups. So, before we go any further, I asked ChatGP to generate for me an image of a robot lobbying. ChatGPT, as you can see, refused point blank, but it did offer me an image to work with. So it said, imagine a sleek, futuristic robot with polished metal casing, 
confidently in a bustling government office or legislative chamber. It's surrounded by human politicians engaging them in discussion. The robot's digital display might show charts and graphs and data to support its argument, emphasizing its logical approach to lobby. So exclusively and just for you, I made some images because ChatGBT refused. Here is a robot lobbying President Richard Nixon, Henry Kissinger, and the Vice President Spiro Agnew. Here, in a more contemporary room, is a robot lobbying Keir Starmer. Okay, so I want to go back to some of the groups I mentioned and think about how AI can assist them. The first group is lobbyists themselves. How can AI help lobbyists lobby? The obvious thing it can do is, like we've seen with earlier presentations all day, analyze data and even predict what, for example, particular politicians, particular institutions might do in the future so that lobbyists can predict what might happen and take action accordingly for a competitive advantage. Thinking about the more modern form of lobbying, it can also help with the backroom work in doing things like sending emails and mobilizing the public. There's a couple of big questions, again, which were, were covered really well earlier, is to what extent can the existence of AI help level the playing field for lobbying? One of the huge problems for lobbying is that it's dominated by very well-off corporations where smaller groups who want to do lobbying don't get a look in. Is there a way in which this technology could actually make for a more level playing field? For a more negative scenario, what happens when the opacity and sometimes secrecy around lobbying meets the opacity and sometimes secrecy in the black box of AI, because what you could get there, in a worst case scenario, is a double black box, where you have AI secretively doing things within a, a kind of atmosphere that is already secret. It's this latter kind of argument that has been worrying people in the United States. Here's a recent uh, article from the New York Times about this, and they've essentially made this case. Their concern is that in lobbying terms, AI will hijack democracy. It will empower corporations allow them to do even more analysis and prediction that will allow them to even more dominate American politics and gain influence uh, to an even greater extent than it does so now. But let's look from the other perspective. To what extent can AI help those who are trying to monitor and reform lobbying? Well, actually, some of the capabilities work in the same direction. They can, of course, help people monitoring lobbying with data analysis can also help them do the campaign and mobilization, pushing for reform uh, around lobbying. It's possible that further into the future, it can also help with new forms of transparency, new forms of data analysis that can reveal all sorts of new patterns. And finally, it's possible that it can become a backroom tool to help monitors of lobbying do things like send an FOI requests or even act as a journalist. However, much of this also depends on how accessible a lot of these tools are. And one of the concerns is, of course, that over time, they will become increasingly monetized, increasingly enterprise-based, and not accessible. And there the danger is that we head towards a scenario of continued corporate domination, and there is no kind of level playing field. So uh, here's a kind of few concluding points. What I want to do is step out and think about the question of AI and democracy. And anyone who's really interested in this should take a read of a great piece by Andreas Jungher, who's written a really good overview of how AI may interact with politics. And I think we should look at it through these lens. How AI will work with politics very much depends on the context. And the context of lobbying is quite a messy one because it is rather opaque and uncertain and fluid. It very much depends on the reliability of the data. As I've said, one of the problems around lobbying transparency is the fact that it is riddled with loopholes that can be endlessly exploited. And it also very much depends on the predictability of the data. And this is where we have quite a big problem because lobbying evolves over time in all sorts of ways. So patterns of past lobbying behavior are not necessarily a particularly good guide to the future. It also finally, as we, we kind of think about how AI connects with other algorithms, depends on what sort of metrics we use. And if we're asking questions about lobbying based on where money is going, we're going to get a different picture painted than if we're asking, for example, about meetings. 
And this also depends on how people respond to knowing that that data exists. One of the constant fears around transparency is that the existence of greater transparency pushes behavior in new directions rather than kind of solves it. And just as a final, final thought, I'll tell you what ChatGPT thought when I asked it the same question. And actually, it took a rather more, unsurprisingly, conservative view uh, than we have. It did say that robots could help analyze large data sets, it could predict outcomes, and it could help with the mobilization, the grassroots lobbying of automatic communication. But it argued that actually lobbying was a fundamentally human relationship, and that actually, Robots would not be particularly good at it. Thank you, everybody. Uh -huh.